This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. The history of Sergei Prokofiev's Symphony No. 5 is not too different from his own, from acclaim to oblivion and back again. Prokofiev began his career as Russia's enfant terrible, a child prodigy who was obnoxious and condescending to his older classmates at St. Petersburg Conservatory, while at the same time amazing them with his piano virtuosity and scandalizing them with his modernist compositions. He wrote ballets that impressed Stravinsky and Ravel. He almost went bankrupt on a tour of America, returned to a lukewarm reception in Paris, then had another string of successes, including the opera The Love for Three Oranges and the film scores Lieutenant Kija and Alexander Nevsky. By this point, he was back in the Soviet Union, mostly thriving, but always under the watchful eye of the Union of Soviet Composers. In 1944, the Union had set up an artist's colony in the town of Ivanovo, about 150 miles from Moscow, where members could work in a peaceful setting, far from the chaos of World War II. Prokofiev was invited to join a virtual who's who of Soviet composers there, Reinhold Glier, who had been Prokofiev's first composition teacher, Dmitry Shostakovich, Aram Kachaturian, and Dmitry Kabalevsky were all there, and everyone was feeling optimistic about the imminent end of the war. It was there that Prokofiev wrote his Fifth Symphony, a work that would land him on the cover of Time magazine after its premiere, which he said crowned a great period of my work. Only a few years later, though, he would be living under a cloud of suppression, and a proposed performance of the symphony in Utah would bring death threats to the conductor. When Prokofiev began this piece, he hadn't written a symphony in 14 years. It was also the first symphony he had written from scratch since his second in the early 1920s. Numbers three and four had been adaptations of material from his opera The Fiery Angel and the ballet The Prodigal Son. The symphony number five had no program, but Prokofiev announced that it was music glorifying the human spirit, praising the free and happy man, his strength, his generosity, and the purity of his soul. End quote. That was the sort of thing Soviet composers would often say about new works, to at least appear to adhere to the regime's rules for art. What Prokofiev was doing with his Fifth Symphony was something similar to what he had done with his first, exploring the essence of the symphony as defined by Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. But this time, instead of just trying to replicate the structure of the symphony, Prokofiev was also trying to get at its meaning, its substance, and not just its shell. The work is in the traditional four movements, each of which explores sonata form in some way, but the parallels are not all that they seem on the surface. The first movement is an andante, a walking tempo, and follows the traditional sonata form of exposition, development, and recapitulation. There are two versions of the main melody, the first, calm and sustained, and very plainly stated in the woodwinds. The second version soars in the strings. Then the winds join in and the two melodies mingle.
Just when we think he's going to repeat the opening, as Mozart and Haydn would have, Prokofiev borrows a trick from Beethoven and Brahms, repeating the opening for a few bars... then dramatically altering the harmony in order to launch the development section. His transition from the development to the recapitulation is normal, but compressed. The coda looks back to the first theme and comes to a huge climax not once, but twice. With some very inventive and unusual scoring for the percussion, including piano. The second movement is a scherzo. With the violins marking time, the clarinet offers a spunky little tune, and the oboe and violas make an equally sassy response. This is the old Prokofiev, the one who taught Shostakovich a few lessons in musical sarcasm. A slightly slower passage leads into the central section, which would have been the slow section in a Beethoven symphony, but here is actually a little faster than the main section of the movement. When the scherzo returns, it is twisted, even a little sinister. and it ends with a bang. Then comes a dreamy slow movement, which is both somber and lyrical. The strings set the pulse with a pattern that is more than a little reminiscent of the first movement of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. The winds introduce an expansive and beautiful melody, later expanded even further by the strings. The middle section of the movement is much darker, with suggestions of a funeral march. After an intense emotional climax, the first theme returns pianissimo. And delicately scored like the remnants of a dream beginning to vanish. The finale begins in a reflective mood.
with woodwinds and strings in a quiet dialogue. But suddenly the mood changes as the opening theme of the first movement returns, played by a four-voice choir of cellos. Just as suddenly, these moods are swept away. And except for a brief, somber interlude, From here to the end, the mood is joyous and the motion athletic. This is what Prokofiev called his toccata mood with the orchestra in perpetual motion. Throughout, the composer keeps finding new ways of pumping things up. Until, after a dizzying swirl of music, He ends his symphony on a rush to the big finish. Even though Prokofiev won the Stalin Prize first class for this symphony, he never had another piece acclaimed the way this one was, either at home or abroad. In 1948, he was condemned by Stalin's music police, along with his friend Shostakovich, and as the Cold War intensified, performances of his work in the West became fewer and farther between. He continued to compose, but he was never quite the same, and he died, ironically, about an hour before Stalin. From acclaim to oblivion and back again, Prokofiev's Fifth Symphony has come full circle like its composer, reminding us of what it's like to hear an artist in full command of his craft and his history. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.